Chapter 24 The June recital had gone off without a hitch, and Lisa settled into a summer and fall of choosing and preparing a new repertoire for her debut. The Howard Hotel remained a popular night spot, and now Gunter took to joining Gina for a weekly Friday night visit. As winter came, the battles of Europe even raged more intensely, and it was decided to wait a season to rent Wigmore Hall for the debut. Rationing was severe, and people's minds were on war, not music. January saw the Allies battling through a frozen Europe, taking back city after city from the Third Reich. Russia marched through Poland, and the United States and Great Britain liberated Dresden in a firestorm. When she heard there was a battle raging for Vienna, Lisa went to the synagogue and said a special prayer. Would her city disappear as Dresden did? Through the avalanche of news, the children of Wellesden Lane waited. Waited for letters, waited for word. Stringing from news for the deportation camps where they knew their parents were waiting to be liberated. Lisa tried to center herself in the music and in her practice, and Mrs. Lloyd helped her perfect the repertoire for her debut. In the middle of the passage, the doors to the studio flew open, and two excited girls poked in their heads. Hurry up! Haven't you heard? When Lisa lifted her hands from the keys, they could hear the faraway bells, the pealing of Big Ben. Then the sounds gathered momentum and were joined by the bells of the churches all throughout London. Lisa ran to the window. People were running and shouting and jumping in the air. Union Jack sprouted from every window and horns were honking wildly. Lisa had never seen Mrs. Floyd move so fast, but there she was, leading a group of excited students down the spiral staircase and into the streets where they joined the growing crowd. They boarded a packed trolley which weaved through a sea of revelers, wearing paper hats and wavy noisemakers, headed for Buckingham Palace. When the trolley could no longer move, they got out and pushed the remaining blocks to the mall, where Churchill himself was addressing the throng. Lisa was awestruck. She heard his broadcast, seen him on the newsreels and in the newspapers, but here he was in person, the man whose words had given strength to everyone during the dark years. God bless you all. This is your victory, he roared into the microphone. There, we stood alone. Did a new one want to give in? The prime minister's words echoed across the vast expanse. No, the crowd shouted. We were downhearted. No. In all our long history, we have never seen a greater day than this, he said, waving his famous hat. Then, when it seemed the crowd could not get any more excited, the king and queen and the princesses appeared on the balcony, waving as the crowds cheered. The war in Europe was over. Hitler was dead. The Allies had taken Berlin. The horror was over, at least for the millions of British who had fought so proudly and suffered so much. Staring at the joy on people's faces, Lisa was suddenly overcome with a shiver of isolation and sadness. When would the war be over for her? or for her friends at the hostel. From the swirl of the crowd, Mrs. Floyd and the other students reappeared and invited Lisa to join them for a victory dinner. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa answered, but I think maybe I should celebrate with the others at home. She said suddenly, not feeling at all, in a celebratory mood. Are you sure? Her teacher yelled above the noisy crowd. Lisa nodded her head and waved goodbye as the two students grabbed Mrs. Floyd by the hand pushing the elegant English lady into the conga line that danced away from her. Lisa headed away from the ruckus festivities. At first, they were just rumors, unsubstantiated rumors, impossible rumors, which spread like wildfire through the already broken hearts of the Jewish community. Place names like Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Norchhausen, Auschwitz, and Therenstadt were whispered from ear to ear. Talk of mass graves, piles of bodies, unspeakable acts. Photos leaked of hollowed-eyed people staring from behind barbed wire fences, their bony bodies hardly able to stand. Lisa couldn't read most of the articles about it in the newspaper. She couldn't bear to hear what she was told. She had known the terror of the Nazis, seen Kristallnacht, but never could have imagined what had transpired unreported behind Nazi lines. The Red Cross the Jewish Refugee Agency, and the U.S. Army began to post lists of concentration camp survivors as they were liberated, moved, and organized in camps for displaced persons. Lisa flocked with the other desperate refugees to the agencies posting the lists. The pages were chaotic and disorganized. 
taped to walls in crowded hallways, put up as soon as beleaguered workers could type them to help the frantic search of the heartbroken relatives. She went every day to see if the new list had been compiled, going over and over the old ones with care, seeing that there were no jurors on the list. Lisa looked for Leo's names. There were dozens of Swartzes, but no Leos and no Rosies. One day, Gunter found his mother's name on the list from the displaced persons camp near Theronstadt. He spent the day writing hurried telegrams to make contact. When he returned to the hostel, he was so sensitive to the other's pain that he told only Gina about his news, feeling it was selfish to talk openly of his good fortune. Mrs. Cohen heard and spread the word, feeling it important that what little joy there was should be shared. During those first months of searching, Lisa would often lie on her bed and stare at her parents' pictures and try hard to remember their faces. Sometimes, but only in a dream, she thought she could catch a glimpse of her mother's expression on Christian Lock when she had wiped the blood from her father's face. And she could sometimes see the smile her mother gave her when they would play together at the piano after her lesson with Professor Easels. Yishkadal vi Yishkadash. May the great name of God be exalted. Nightly the prayers at the synagogue chanted the names of the departed. One weekend afternoon, a familiar figure walked through the front door of the hostel. It was Aaron Lewin, carrying his Royal Air Force satchel and wearing the insignia of lieutenant. Mrs. Cohen was the first to recognize him. Aaron, how wonderful to see you. Come in, come in. Is Lisa here? he asked. Direct as always. Yes, she's upstairs. Please go on up. Aaron, Lisa yelled leaping off the bed. It's so good to see you, and it was good to see him. He looked so mature, so sophisticated. She gave him a hug, but the feeling between them was distant. She had gotten no letters from him for many months. I was worried about you. Are you all right? Never better, he answered, but his expression said the opposite. This place looked like it needs some attention, he continued, glancing at the cracked glass of the window. Maybe I should grab the toolbox. Lisa smiled and led him to the kitchen to find the matron. She knew that Aaron needed time to get his bearings. They spent the day together. Lisa watched as Aaron tackled the mechanical things that badly needed fixing. After lunch, Lisa felt it was time to broach the difficult questions she had been waiting all morning to ask. Have you heard anything about your family? About your mother? My mother is dead. So are my brothers, he answered not adding any details. How? I don't know. How would we ever know? Then how are you sure they're dead? We just have to assume it, don't we? He said flatly, trying to shield himself from the pain of his words. How can you just assume it, she said, starting to get upset. Lisa, you must be realistic. I think it's time you faced it. What are the chances of any of them survived? Am I supposed to give up hope? Is that what you're saying? Lisa asked, trying to sound defiant. But her words came out half-hearted. Could it be possible that she would never see her parents or Rosie again? As the long summer afternoon was ending, Aaron asked Lisa to come with him into the back garden. They walked to the hedge that separated the hostel from the convent next door. Lisa's heart was still heavy from the terrible realizations that were beginning to wash over her. Aaron had his back to her, as he said, I'll be leaving for New York. I've managed a visa for America. Oh, she said, with an involuntary gasp. Still facing away from her, he continued. Will you come with me? Lisa was silent. Her world was fragmenting around her. She was facing the loss of everyone she held dear. Could she bear to lose Aaron, even if she knew her feelings had changed? She didn't know she had the strength to say no. When Aaron turned around, he saw her deep and troubled thought and knew her answer. A week later, Aaron came to the hostel before his final departure, bringing candies and cakes. He was trying to be positive and forward-looking, fighting, as they all were, for a reason to go on. He had found his in his journey to America. Lisa's reason? She didn't know. She could only stand on the steps of the hostel next to Gunter and Gina and wave goodbye.